Um, why don't we get started? Thank you for bearing with me. All right, so homework one is out on uh, the course Blackboard in the homework folder inside of course documents. It is due a week from today, and it will involve your design of a survey, which will also require you to think about to think about a population uh, of interest. And so you'll be exercising uh, some of the considerations that we discussed uh, in our conversation uh, about uh, the homeless population and sampling and sampling errors and experimental design. Uh, the, the problem is uh, purposefully open-ended, uh, so you can choose um, any aspect of um, student life or campus life or anything uh, you feel uh, will impact uh, positively uh, the student experience at Delaware State University. And so um, should be interesting uh, and uh, you're free to choose any topic uh, of uh, your interest. And so you'll be designing in this uh, assignment, uh, you'll be thinking about the population You'll be structuring that population, and then you'll be doing sampling from that population. So it'll require you uh, to go out and uh, survey people, talk to people. Maybe it's a, a, an online survey. Whatever um, mechanism you choose uh, to gather data um, is completely open uh, uh, to you. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? That makes sense? And so the assignment is up as of, uh, I think it was last night maybe just before midnight, um, but it's certainly up uh, from this morning. Uh, it's been from last night, and so please take a look at it right away. It will require you uh, to really think about what you're doing, and uh, what I'm looking for is you're exercising uh, concepts that we talked about pertaining to uh, population, uh, population design, sampling, and issues that may arise uh, with sampling. So you'll be... Uh, creating some samples or taking some samples, and then you'll be computing some statistic uh, over those samples. It's of your choosing. Uh, you'll be visualizing uh, the result of your data, and then based on that, you'll be making a recommendation uh, in written form, uh, along with the other stuff. Um, you'll be making a recommendation about what can be done to improve it, right? So certainly, uh, the measurement that you take, data you collect, should be something that will highlight or illustrate um, what it is, uh, what is the problem uh, that you're trying to address. And then secondly, uh, the other part in the assignment is that uh, when you make a recommendation uh, for something, uh, you are to discuss what you think uh, the result of that implementation of that recommendation would be. So if you're able to implement that recommendation, what do you think the result would be? How would it affect the numbers? Uh, how do you believe it would affect the numbers uh, that you uh, measured and reported on and visualized uh, from the rest of uh, the assignment. Okay? Questions? Does that make sense? Okay. And so this is also to illustrate that when you actually go out and uh, collect the data and perform experiments and report statistics, all the work uh, that comes before the visualization, uh, it's a little bit more messy, but also you have to consider carefully what it is, uh, what statement you're trying to make. Okay, so this is due on Thursday, a week from today, seven days, which is January 30th. Uh, kind of hard to believe that January is <laughs> over in a week, which is weird. Just not that long ago, it was Christmas. But anyways, um, let's continue on. So when we left off last time, uh, we talked about uh, some measurements uh, for the CPU time for 30 randomly selected processes or jobs executing on some processor. And so these are the numbers, there are 30 of them, three rows of 10 uh, measurements. And we're going to consider uh, these measurements. And assuming they come from some distribution, you can imagine um, there's some distribution out there that is responsible for giving you the values that you see. Right, uh, And when we studied from last time, we said a gamma distribution refers to a so-called multi-phased execution. And in this particular case, you could model this problem as a multi-phase execution where the alpha parameter is 30 because we have 30 uh, measurements corresponding to 30 different jobs uh, from on this processor. And so um, you want to collect data, and of course we have this data, 
right? And certainly, uh, given the data, you compute some statistic. And you can use all sorts of statistics, things that we've studied before and things that we will talk about uh, this semester. Uh, things like the mean, uh, which is the center of mass for the distribution, uh, or the probability distribution. Uh, the median, which we haven't talked about, uh, the central value of the distribution. Uh, the two are related, but they are not the same. Uh, the quantiles. Quantiles are values that effectively slice the distribution into equal pieces. And when I say equal pieces, I mean the area under the curve. So you can imagine uh, a distribution uh, floating out there, and that distribution describes the probability associated uh, with certain values, right? So the probability for Poisson of observing five people in some uh, standard unit of time, delta t, uh, probability of observing six people, seven people, eight people, and so forth. And so if you take that distribution, you choose a number of values over that which that distribution is defined, and you choose values such that when you take the area under the curve uh, between the values corresponding to the boundaries of those pieces, um, it's uh, a t uh, some standard piece of the area of, uh, under the curve. So you can choose uh, quantiles such that the distribution is to cut into 0.1 uh, probability or 10% pieces, right? 10 equal equiprobably, equiprobabilistically sized pieces, or you could do it and choose values, three values, that cut the distribution into four pieces. Now, the general term for those values are called quantiles, uh, but quartiles are specific quantiles. Uh, they're pieces that cut the distribution into four equal sized pieces. And so if you cut a distribution using its quantiles uh, and took the area under the curve for each of those regions of the cut up distribution, you're gonna get 0.25 probability if you take the uh, integral uh, between the bounds of the quantiles. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? And so you might be wondering why even do that, right? Um, you do that because you want to understand how that distribution changes as you go over regions over which that distribution is defined. We talked about variance as this idea of a dispersion measure, but variance isn't the only way you measure dispersion, right? You can use the quartiles, something called interquartile range, uh, to ma measure the dispersion of the distribution. Because effectively, when you measure dispersion, what you're interested in is how much probability is spread across the values in certain uh, ranges of values over which that probability distribution is defined, right? Uh, because that will tell you a lot about the values or measurements you will encounter if you continue to sample from that underlying system giving you those values, okay? So... We have the quartiles, which are the four quantiles. Uh, we have variance, which we talked about last semester, which describes the dispersion without regard to uh, direction about the mean. And then we had a problem with variance and that variance, uh, there's a squared term, right? Because it's a value minus uh, the mean uh, squared times the probability, which defines the variance. And if you're trying to talk about the dispersion of a distribution relative to its center, that square term introduces a problem because the mean of a distribution, for example, that traffics in temperatures uh, is gonna be so many degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius, depending on what your uh, units are, but the variance is gonna be uh, degrees Fahrenheit squared, right? So how do you make a comparison between two systems if that dispersion measure is a squared term, squared units, and that uh, center is uh, not squared? And so the solution to that was a standard deviation where for the standard deviation, actually now I'm getting paranoid. I can't remember if I hit record. So let me, yeah, yeah, I did. Okay, all right. You do something sort of in autopilot mode and you can't remember because, all right. So uh, when we talked about variance, uh, it has a square term in there. And so the units end up being squared and it's hard to make comparisons right, um, or relate it to uh, the central value, namely the mean. Um, and so the standard deviation was a solution to that. And for standard deviation, you took the square root of the variance. And uh, now taking the square root, it now becomes uh, plus or minus within this uh, same units. And so uh, oftentimes when you talk about the dispersion or the spread of a distribution, uh, you'll describe it in terms of uh, the mean center value plus or minus some uh, number times the standard deviation. And so that's the basis of something we'll talk about called hypothesis testing. And for hypothesis testing, uh, you're determining whether or not 
some value is typical of the types of values corresponding to a, a distribution, right? So let's say, you know, you observe uh, Starbucks and you uh, measure the number of people who come in per unit time, maybe it's every hour, or maybe it's every half an hour, and you pose that as a Poisson distribution. And based on those numbers, you set the parameters uh, defining that Poisson distribution. Now, of course, that Poisson uh, distribution is going to have a dispersion. And how you might talk about that particular coffee shop, the behavior of the number of customers that arrive in time, um, that will happen under that Poisson distribution's governing values, plus or minus some, uh, 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 some distance away from the center. And so when you do hypothesis testing, what you're doing is you're saying, given a new arrival rate, let's say you know 100 people come in in one uh, unit time, is this thing typical of that particular distribution? And how you measure typical is by saying, is it likely to have been generated uh, in a range of values uh, which is the center of the distribution plus or minus some uh, multiple of the standard deviation. And so it's known uh, that 95% or 0.95 of the probability mass total uh, occurs uh, within a distance that's plus or minus um, 1.96 standard deviations above and below uh, the mean. And so that's what hypothesis testing is. Spam filters use it uh, to determine if an email was legitimate uh, or spam. Okay, uh, interquartile range is another way of measuring the spread, and we'll talk about that. It looks at uh, the difference uh, between the quartiles uh, for two different distributions. And it's based on the quartiles, not on notions of integrating under the curve uh, for the probability. And quartile range is another way of measuring or performing what that hypothesis testing uh, is trying to do. Okay, all right, any questions about this? Does it make sense? Yeah, all right. So. Let's take a look at one statistic, the sample mean. And the sample mean is noted as X bar. And the sample mean uh, is a good replacement uh, for the probabilistic mean. Now, we talked about probabilistic mean uh, last semester as being this notion of a probabilistic average. Uh, and we noted that as being the expectation of that particular random variable, i.e. the measurement over uh, that population. And so, again, to draw your memories, when you take the expectation, you multiply that particular value times its probability, and you sum all of them together uh, if it's a discrete uh, probability distribution. If it's a continuous probability distribution, meaning that that random variable measures a real value quantity like temperature, pressure, and so forth, uh, then you're going to use integration instead of summation. And so the sample mean uh, is nothing more than the arithmetic average. So you have a bunch of measurements, and these measurements are samples. So we have big X1, big X2, big X3, dot, 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 plus a big Xn. So in this particular case, we have n many, little n, n many uh, measurements that we take. Uh, so that's like, you know, uh, you have a, a, a thermometer, and then you just make a bunch of temperature readings over some uh, space of time. And so the sample mean in uh, this case, or in all cases, is the sum of all of your measurements, x1 through xn, n many, and then you take the arithmetic average. You divide that sum by n. Okay. Any questions about this? So whether you knew it or not, when you take the average, you're computing the so-called sample mean, and we note the sample mean uh, using the symbol X bar. Now, it's X that's capitalized because it uh, is a nod to the fact that X is a random variable and it corresponds to a bunch of measurements. And this statistic, right, it is a statistic, it's a function over the data. What function is it? It's take the average of a bunch of measurements. Okay? All right, any questions? No? All right. So the sample mean, X bar, is what's called an estimate, and you could even say an estimator, right? An estimate uh, for the population mean. And so let's describe or think about that idea of the Poisson distribution, right? Or any sort of distribution. Let's say it's a distribution of ages of people within a population. Now, of course, you don't know ground truth what the average, uh, average age is of the population in Dover. In order to know ground truth, you'd have to uh, contact every single person in the city of Dover. Now, even with only 37,000 uh, some other change uh, people in the city of Dover, and that's not the folks who work in Dover, um, that's the people who have a residence or live in Dover, um, even though it's a small town, or I like to say town, um, even though it's a small town, 
it's impossible, next to impossible, uh, to contact every single person that lives in Dover. So you'll never know, uh, ground truth, uh, what uh, the mean is uh, for the distribution of ages for people in the city of Dover. So what do you do? You go out and you sample, okay? Well, if you're going to sample uh, from this population, um, where do you sample them from? So you have to think about uh, people who live in Dover or have a residence in Dover, right? What populations might that be? So you think, gosh, well, since this deals with age, I'm going to imagine my population uh, consists of people of perhaps different age ranges because your age to a large degree determines roughly uh, what you're going to be doing. So when you're a young, young child, right, maybe you're in daycare or maybe you are uh, with family members when you're uh, very, very young, right, from the age of infancy up through, say, five or six before you enter the school system, right, you're doing something different from when you're school age, uh, whether that's grammar school, middle school, or high school. And then after high school, uh, some uh, will uh, take on a job or some vocation, right, of employment directly out of high school. Some will go off to college. So the college students, they're still considered residents because their primary residence is still in Dover, but they're not there for the nine months of the year of the semester. And uh, maybe they're not there for even more than nine months. And then if you consider those who are of kind of working age, they're going to be in some uh, job somewhere. And if that job is outside of Dover, they're not going to be there during employment hours, but they'll certainly be there uh, in the evening. Right. Um, and then you have the retirees. Now, certainly the retirees, you might just lose some people. They might move out of uh, Dover uh, for retirement or they might stay in Dover. And so if you're thinking about that population in terms of people uh, in ter uh, as measured by their age in the city of Dover, there's a lot of consideration that comes into play about who this population is. Right. You can't really know what the age group is ground truth. So this idea of an expectation mu uh, ground truth that governs this distribution uh, that gives you these ages, um, you don't know it. So the next best thing you can do is find a statistic. Uh, this particular statistic, x, x bar, the sample mean, is something that's a good replacement uh, for estimating or standing in place of the ground truth mean, which you don't know. Okay? And so Let's try this in MATLAB. I'm going to pop out and bring up MATLAB, and I'll illustrate to you uh, some ideas uh, uh, that govern uh, the sample mean. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a population of numbers, right, uh, 100,000 different numbers, and these numbers are going to be uh, randomly selected uh, in terms of whole year ages, so one-year-old, two-year-old, infancy is zero, up through, let's say, 110. Right. Um, I certainly hope all of you make it past 110, but it seems like a good number uh, to, uh, to, to, to have as the upper bound of ages for people uh, in Dover. And so we're going to define our population. And just to show you what the true mean is new of this population, I'm just going to compute it. Right now, this is just an illustration. But in the real world, this ground truth uh, mean, this population mean, that parameter that governs the numbers uh, that we have in the population, ground truth, it's hidden from you. You have no access to it, right? Uh, that's what it means to be a population parameter. You have no access to it, but I'm going to show it to you and then draw samples from that, k many samples, and I'll show you the relationship uh, between uh, the sample mean and the population mean, okay? All right, so let's uh, pop out of this uh, screen show. I'm getting a little bit of a glare from across there. Um, I'll minimize that and let's bring up MATLAB and I hope the license server is working. It should, it usually does. And again, I'm hearing Tansy. <clears throat> All right, classes, spring, that's machine learning. Um, this is analytics, uh, MATLAB. Uh, let me do this. Let me go back one. Ah, why is this thing so slow? It's it's um okay, it's scanning the directories. Let me do that. Let me just create a new script. It's still scanning. So when you run MATLAB and you have a lot of stuff in your directory, it caches or stores directory information, and sometimes it can take there we go a little time to uh, update its uh, listing. Okay, so add path, 
subfolders. There we go. Let me go in here. So let me create a new script. Why is this pausing? Oh, come on. There we go. All right, let me create a new script. Hello. New script. Okay, there we go. All right. So let me uh, uh, let me make this a little smaller. Okay. A little bit bigger. Okay, so let's first save that, and we'll call it um, test um, sample mean uh, 2020. There we go. So let me save that. And so we'll start out uh, with the population. So population equals zeros. And let's say it's one by population size. Okay. And so population size, we're going to make it 100,000 people. So population size, we'll make it 100000. Zero, 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 zero. Okay. So that's going to be uh, an array of integers, or at least we'll store integers in these, uh, it's just array of doubles, and these integers will each uh, represent um, an age. And so um, for, actually, we could just do random integer. Um, that's a little bit easier. Help random integer. And we're going to create a random integer. Um, we're going to create an array of random integers from the minimum age, which is zero, to the maximum age of, um, we said, 110. And we're going to um, do that 100,000 times. So population size, that. So min age, we're going to call that zero. Max age, just to be sort of, you know, exercise some uh, software engineering, is going to be 110 uh, years old. And when we create this population, uh, let's say random integer, and the bounds are going to be from the min age to the maximum age. Okay, so that's the numbers, uh, range of numbers that it'll draw from. So uniform at random, it's going to take uh, cre uh, create an integer, so a whole number um, in the interval, closed interval from zero uh, and uh, to 110, to 110 in this case. And so, how many how many of them are we going to create? We're going to create one by um, uh, population size, right? So that says create a one by 100,000 array uh, that's going to have integers randomly selected from the interval uh, between 0 and 110. And of course, you know, if you abstract things using variables, it's a lot easier uh, to test experiments and try things out uh, in your code, OK? Any questions? No? All right, so uh, it's important to test things incrementally. And you know, my own practice, I like to say display done uh, only because it gives me an executable statement at the end uh, that I can set a breakpoint on and check out the values uh, uh, the pro in the program that I have uh, thus far. So I'm going to do that set a breakpoint at the end on an executable statement. And when I hit run, um, I have uh, an array. And this array is 1 by 100,000, so I have a 100,000 vector. And in each position uh, is, an, is an integer. And that integer, in each case, is between 0 and 110 and is drawn uniformly uh, from uh, that interval. OK? Any questions about this? So now we have our population. And if I want to uh, compute the population mean, right, uh, there is a routine, help mean, right, in MATLAB, that will give you the mean, and it'll give you all the other things. So I'm going to compute the mean uh, of that population, and I'll just call it mu, which is the population mean. So mu equals mean of population, population, okay. Now, of course, you know, every time I run this, uh, this will be a different population because it's going to randomly select it. And so there are two alternatives that I can make. Let me just... Um, uh, first check something in random integer, help Randy, before I go any further, Randy, let's see, let me um, go to MATLAB. So one of the things, oh, that's some research stuff, um, that randomized number generators can do is uh, accept what's called a random number seed. And a random number seed is um, a number 
that the randomization algorithm keys in off of. And if you specify this each time to random number generator, each time you run it, it's going to generate the same so-called random number sequence, right? So in that case, if you have a randomized experiment and you want to reproduce uh, the same sequence of random numbers, uh, you can do that with a seed. So MATLAB, Randy, uh, number seed. Um, let me see if there's a uh, seed to the random number. Uh, control random number generation in MATLAB. Um, so uh, we give it S, RNG of S. Seed's a random number generator using non-negative integer seed so that Randy produces a predictable sequence of numbers. Okay, so I call RNG and I give it uh, a non-negative integer. So I'll just get RNG of three and I'll explain to you uh, a little bit more what I mean by that. RNG and we'll just give it the seed of three, right? And so when you generate a random number, uh, you call it again and again and again. And in this particular example, when I call Randy and I say one comma population size, I'm underneath the covers in MATLAB implementation of random integer. It's calling uh, random ra uh, the random number generator 100,000 times. And so uh, when I do that, each time I run this program, it's going to be a different sequence of random numbers. But what I want to do is to say, give me a sequence, but keep that sequence fixed over time. And what I'm doing when I specify the seed is I want to keep the population the same. Right? Um, there are two ways I can keep it the same. Either I can force the random number generator uh, to generate the same sequence of random numbers each time I call it, or I could generate it once, save it to a file, and then read that file each time. Does that make sense? Any questions? And so in this experiment, I want to make sure this population of 100,000 people, as defined by their age measurement, uh, stays the same. And so that's why I'm going through all of this. All right, so if we look at that, we'll test that assertion or test that um, uh, ability, right? And if you see this, I have 61, 78, 32, 56, 99, 99, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's quit debugging and let's run it again. And I have 61, 78, 32, 56, 99, blah, 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 right? And you notice each time it's the same sequence of random numbers. And that has to deal with, or an experiment, having what's called repeatability. Right? Because if you're trying to make a good simulation of something that requires randomization, if you look at a population of people, if I measure something on the population now versus 30 minutes from now, um, it doesn't change very much. So I want to keep it fixed for this experiment because I want to show you the impact of what the sample size does when I compute the sample mean. Okay? All right. So now that I've done that, I have my population. I compute the sample mean, uh, mu. Right, uh, and you don't have access to that in real life. I really want to stress that, but I'm measuring it uh, because I want to make a comparison to show you what happens in the relationship uh, between the sample mean and the ground truth population mean. Okay, so now I'm going to define something called sample size. And sample size, in the beginning, we're only going to contact two people and ask him or her, uh, what is your age? Right? And then I'm going to do that some number of times, and I call that number of times. I'm going to call it a trial. Right? So number of trials equals, and let's say I'm going to do it uh, 100 times. No, um, let's say, yeah, let's say um, 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 uh, uh, let's say 1,000, yeah, 100 times. All right. So now um, that 100 times, I'm going to repeat that measurement of the sample mean, and I'm going to show you how that changes over time as a function of the sample size. So that's like going out and asking two people each time, what is your age, what is your age, what is your age, and you do that uh, perhaps over a short space of time a hundred different times, and you want to show how that sample mean behaves uh, with respect to the ground truth population mean. Does that make sense? Okay. So I start out. 4t equals 1, increment by 1, going up to num trials. And so this is the number of times I'm going to do it. So what I'm going to do when I sample, I want to randomly select some age in the population. And so how I'm going to do that is because I have sample size, I'm going to say generate two um, indices uh, into that array. And then I'm going to pull out the ages at those indices. 
right? Uh, so uh, let me say selector equals randy, give me a random integer in the interval uh, from one, because there's the first index for the first of those 100,000 people in the population, uh, up to 100,000, because there are 100,000 people, right? So I randomly want to select an age for each of those uh, 100,000 people, but I'm only going to do it for two individuals. So from one to population pop size, and those are the valid indices, right? And I want a one by sample size array. So in this particular case, given the current settings uh, of my variables, I say go out and random integer from one to population size. Now these are the indices into the age array, right? Um, so either I'm going to select the first age, right? The second age, the third age, or up to and including the hundred and thousandth age, right? In that uh, population. Uh, and then I'm only going to, I'm going to do that two times or sample size many different times. Does that make sense? All right, so let's take a look at this, and you'll notice also I'm incrementally uh, building this code uh, as we go along and testing it. That's really important, right? Don't just write it all and then run it and then think it's going to work. If, if it works the first time, you're doing something wrong, right, which is what we used to say when I was in industry. All right, so nonetheless, let's do that. So I'm going to set a breakpoint inside of the for loop, and I'm going to run. And so my population has not changed, you'll notice, 61, 78, 32, 56, 99, blah, blah, 99, blah, 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 right? So it's the same population each time. And so for my selector, if I say step, that selector is going to be two numbers, so it's a one by two array, and those numbers will be indices into that um, population array. So index 72,605 and index 73,919, right? Um, and so now I have that selector, and I'm going to say the samples is equal to go to the population and return, return back to me the individuals at these indices in the selector. So if I say one comma, that's row number one, but the column number is going to be each of these integers inside a position of the selector. And so what MATLAB does, if you specify uh, in a computation, uh, something in an array, it's going to iterate through each position of that array and apply each of those values uh, to that evaluation. And so here, uh, my selector is a one by two array, right? Uh, so if I say population of one comma selector, it's going to go to that population array, it's going to index it, the first row, and for the column, it's going to substitute each value that appears in a position of selector. Right, so we have the population array. I say step, and and I populate the samples. So the samples, it's age 109 and age 36. Let's test that uh, assertion. Right, so we have the population array. Right, so I'm going to open up the workspace window, and we just got done saying it's uh, selector it's position 72,605 and 73,919. Uh, right, so if we go to this population array. And this is pretty big. Questions? So we look at 72,000, 74,000, 72,605. I'm not going to do both of them. It takes too long. 72,605 is uh, 605. There we go. Where is it? Other uh, display didn't catch up. All right, so let me do this. Um, population one comma seventy two thousand six o five, right? That value is one hundred and nine. And if we look at population uh, seventy two thousand nine nineteen, that value is sixty one, right? Uh, so here the samples. No, that's not right. Seventy two thousand seventy three thousand nine nineteen. Seventy three thousand nine nineteen. Right, that value is 36. Right, so it's exactly what I'm doing there. I'm using randomly selected into, uh, indices into the population array. Uh, I'm taking two of those indices and then using that uh, by reference uh, to get the values at those positions in the population array. Does that make sense? Any questions? All right, so now that I've sampled from the population, let me now compute the sample mean. So sample mean, sample mean, 
is equal to mean of the samples. Okay, easy enough. And so now what I'm going to do is I want to keep uh, or hold on to these samples because I want to visualize them. And I'm going to do that uh, using a plot, uh, a line chart. Okay, so I'm going to create an array. And I know for each trial, I'm going to compute a sample mean of size, sample size. So I'm going to say the sample means equals zeros one by num trials, right? Because for each trial, I'm going to calculate a sample mean. So now I'll say the sample means uh, one comma t, because on the teeth trial, I'm going to compute a certain sample mean equals, and I'm going to save off sample mean. Okay. So now um, I also uh, want to plot, I'm going to plot uh, the population mean mu against the sample mean. And so in order to plot, I need a vector of each quantity. So I'm going to create um, the population means is equal to zeros, one by um, uh, num trials. Right, and then I'm just going to say the population means equals the pop means plus mu. Right, so what I'm doing here um, is I'm creating an array, and in each position of the array, I'm going to store uh, the population mean. And how I do that is creating an array of zeros. So that's the pop means equals zeros one by num trials, which in this case is one by 100, and then I just add mu. Uh, to each position of that array. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? All right. So now I'm going to plot this. So figure one, and I'm going to plot um, uh, the trial one. No, no. Um, oh, brain oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So I'm going to plot the trial number one colon one colon num trials. And that's going to be along the x-axis trials. And I'm going to plot that against the sample mean, means, right? And then the next line I'm going to plot is going to be uh, the population means, right? One, one uh, num trials along the x-axis, so 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth, uh, the pop means. OK. Uh, so let me um, x label trial num. And we say y label. Let me call it um, uh, uh, age, um, av age. OK. And title. I'm going to say trial versus um, average age. OK, so let's see how that looks. So let's save this, right? Uh, and let's get rid of that breakpoint. Let's run it and see what we get. So the first plot, uh, population means, uh, trial number, so where is our cell? Oh, you know what? Oh, that's why. Hold on. OK. Um, whenever you plot, you want to hold on so that you preserve the, the pen or the palette, if you will, uh, because plot wants to wipe away the graph area and then replot. Uh, so let's, uh, let's run this again. OK. So the first thing we plotted was the sample means. And this has a uh, number of samples is two, and the second plot we did was the population mean. So the population mean in this graph is in red, uh, and the um, sample mean is in blue. So as you can see, the population mean mu uh, is is uh, is 55.1146 uh, years, right? And over time, for each of the hundred many trials, it doesn't change, right? Because the mean population mean mu doesn't change. But you'll see here uh, the sample mean it jumps all over the place, right? And in this particular case, uh, the sample size uh, that we used to compute the sample mean was size two. Uh, going back to the theory, uh, we had x bar is equal to x1 plus x2 uh, divided by two, right? And so that's a lousy uh, sample mean, 
right? And as we said before, when we talked about this idea of sampling error, uh, because a sample uh, gathers people uh, from a large population, you could be very unlucky and you might end up when you contact people, if you're only contacting two people, you might end up, you know, maybe, you know, it's near DSU and you end up contacting two people of traditional college age, right? You're going to very, very inadequately uh, represent the quantity that you're trying to represent about your population. And so we said that how you can fix sampling error um, in uh, the sampling error case um, is by increasing the sample size. Uh, so let's do that and uh, take a look at the result uh, of what happens when we do this. And so let's uh, set uh, the range here uh, so that the graph doesn't resize. MATLAB likes to resize the scale of the graph for you because it wants the graph to look really big. And in this particular case, uh, we don't want to do that. Uh, we want the graph uh, scale to stay the same so we can see the effect of what happens uh, as you increase the sample size. Uh, so let's do that. Um, help access. Right, so axis, I think it was, you give it x min, x max, y min, y max. Okay, so let's say axis, um, uh, after we hold on, so let's say axis, and we say x min is going to be um, uh, uh, zero, um, no, one, no, zero. Uh, x max, let's say x min, x max, y min, y max. x max is going to be num trials, right? Um, y min is going to be age zero, uh, min age, and y max is going to be max age, right? I don't want it to resize the graph. I want it to keep uh, the axis scale the same so that you can see the effect of uh, the sample size. Otherwise, it'll rescale it and you know, you won't be able to tell very easily. Okay, so let's do that. So we run that, and we see this particular graph. Okay, uh, let's see what happens uh, if we uh, change the sample size. So I'm going to keep that figure up, and you'll actually see it change um, as I rerun this. So quit debugging, and let's change the sample size from 2. Let's double it. Let's uh, call it f uh, 4. No, let's call it 10. So instead of two people, uh, you're going to contact 10 people, and we'll see how this changes. So I'm going to kind of scroll this down so you can see the graph, and we'll see something happen here. So you notice, uh, you should notice that uh, mu, the ground truth um, uh, expected uh, value for the population, uh, the mean age, is not going to change. But what should change is the blue graph, uh, the sample mean. So we do that. Oh, I should see clear. It's redrawing. All right, let me do this. Quit. Clear. Uh, let me rerun this. So when we do that, we can see the population mean doesn't change. It still should be 55 point uh, something, 55.1146. But the sample mean uh, looks like it's getting more and more narrow, right? Uh, so let's change this uh, to figure two, right? It'd be a little bit easier to see the difference uh, as you change the sample size. So we'll save that and call it figure two. And we'll change the sample size from 10. Let's make it um, let's make it a uh, hundred, right? An order of magnitude larger sample size, and so we're to display that as Figure Two, right? So there's Figure Two, and one of the things that you'll notice here, right, is Figure One. Let me stretch Figure Two and make it as big as Figure One to make the fair comparison. So one of the things you notice, Figure One, that was our sample size of 10. And figure two, that was our sample size of 100. You notice here, when the sample size was uh, 10, right, it kind of varied some degree above and below the ground truth. And in our sample size is 100, it gets closer uh, to the ground truth um, population mean, right? So conceivably, all right, well, we said at the outset before when we said you can fix sampling errors by increasing the sampling size. Let's see how far we can go with uh, changing the sample size to try to see if it's acceptable uh, with respect to the ground truth population. So let's call that figure three. We'll quit debugging, right, and we'll save. And now we'll increase uh, the sample size. Uh, we increased it to 100. Let's increase it to, say, 500 and see what happens, so fivefold. So before we had 10, then we increased it to 100, and now we're increasing it to 500. Uh, so let's take a look at that. We call this figure three. 
right? Uh, so let's run this, right? Uh, and uh, let's stretch figure three to be the same size as figures one and two, the two different versions for a sample size of 10 and a sample size of uh, 100. So here we have our sample size of, um, in figure one, we have our, why is that so jagged? All right, um, we have our sample size of 10, right? And if we look at the swing, it swings about plus or minus, we'll say about 25 or 30 or so above and below the ground truth population mean. When we change our sample size uh, to size 100, uh, we got a swing plus or minus, uh, looks like five above and below uh, our 55 and change uh, for our, our population mean. When we made it 100, well, it didn't seem like it, 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 oh, actually it did a little bit. It, it, we had some minor improvements. Uh, let's try, instead of, of the 500, let's try one last thing, and let's make it, say, 10,000, something that's just much, much, much greater on the sample size to illustrate this point. Uh, so I'll make that figure four. Let me quit, uh, save. And so we go from sample size of 500. Uh, let's go, oh, num trials. Ah, I changed the wrong thing. Oh, crap. All right. So sample size of, um, instead of, I uh, should have done this, and let's call it figure, uh, da, 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 da. Um, let's redo figure three. Um, I changed the wrong thing. So I intended to say sample size of 500, num trials 100. That's why it looks so uh, bushy uh, from before. So figure three, we're going to redo. So let me kill off figure three here, and let's rerun that. Uh, there we go. All right, that looks better. So figure three had a sample size of 500, the same 100 trials. And so when we look at this, instead of being plus or minus five, it's a little bit tighter, right? It looks like plus or minus three and change, plus or minus four, right? And so let's go back and do the 10,000 uh, that I was originally uh, trying to do, and we'll call that figure four. So we had a sample size of 10, sample size of 100, sample size of 500, and now we're trying a sample size of 10,000. So here, I'll make sure I change the right thing, sample size of 10,000, uh, right? Uh, so let me save that. I'm gonna do it 100 uh, many times, and we'll call that figure, uh, figure, let's call that figure, was that three before? Uh, two, three, let's call it figure four, okay. Uh, so figure four, uh, save, everything looks good, trials 100, sample size 10,000, and let's try that, and it looks like it's pretty close, right? Uh, so if we um, blow that up, so it's the same size as the others, and if you notice here, right, it's spot on some of the time, right? So here, our graph, when it swings widely, it's swinging uh, 56, so it's just like a year or so difference. And so what we see is that effect of trying to recover from sampling error uh, that we talked about before uh, by increasing the sample size, right? And so the question in practical terms, let's say you're doing this on a level of census or a medium-sized city or, you know, some sensor that gives you a lot of data. Now, you can't go willy-nilly uh, increase the sample size as much as you want and Theoretically, you can, because that's how the theory works when you take the limit uh, in infinity. Um, but the problem is the amount of computation you can afford, right? And so there's always this balance between how um, uh, representative the sample mean is of the population mean, and it gets closer, excuse me, closer and closer uh, as you increase the sample size, absolutely. And this plays out also in that lab. Uh, but the practical engineering limitation you have is based on the amount of computation that you have, right? So if you needed, for example, for some distribution, if you needed a sample size uh, uh, of like a million, and let's say it's a million images for some sort of image classification problem, maybe you don't have the computation to be able to process a million images. Right, And so there's always this trade-off, but in absence of the engineering practicalities, you'll see here uh, that as you increase the sample size, uh, the sample mean gets closer and closer and closer to the population mean. Right, And this is just to tell you, well, I'm showing you the population mean. 
right? Because I want to show you that the theory does work in reality. But in reality, you don't see this red line, right? You don't know what that red line is for the average age of the homeless population, even in a city as small as Dover, right? Uh, but what you do see is you see this jagged blue line, right? And so the question is, how many times do I compute the sample mean? If I know that um, as you increase the sample size, it'll get better and better and better, meaning closer and closer and closer uh, to the population mean. Now, the answer that I'll show you, um, maybe not today, maybe on uh, Tuesday, uh, is there are certain quality measures that you can apply to your estimators, right? And so these statistical tools, yes, we have these estimators, but then how do you know whether or not your estimator is a good replacement for this unknown ground truth uh, population parameter. And so you apply these tests, and if these tests say, yes, this thing is sound, then you can say, aha, well, this is a good replacement for this unknown quantity. Does that make sense? All right. Any questions about this? All right. Uh, so let's go back uh, to the slides. Let me bring down MATLAB. And um, I can certainly post this example uh, on uh, the Blackboard. I'll probably do it in the lectures slide section and name it so that it's right next to, um, or maybe I'll upload it so it's in the same entry uh, for this particular module to make it easy. Uh, so I'll post that, um, not necessarily after this class, but certainly after my second class that lets out uh, at 1.15. Okay. Um, if there are no final questions, no final questions? No? All right. So let's uh, bring down MATLAB and let's go back uh, to the slide deck uh, with the balance of times 1029, so we have 15 minutes. Okay. All right. And so, you know, it's one thing to study theory, but when you see it play out uh, in reality, um, that's what it really uh, drives home, the point we're trying to make. And so I just had a single population, right? And that single population had ages that were randomly sampled uh, from infancy age zero up through um, age 110. Now, of course, in reality, if you're going to simulate natural population, it's not going to be uh, uniform, right? Uh, so it happens in Delaware, um, I think some like 60% of college age uh, uh, young people leave the state, right? And so you're going to have a drop off uh, for the 18 uh, to 22, 18 to 24 uh, age range in the state of Delaware. And so if you're going to model something about the population of Delaware uh, in terms of age, you want to partition uh, your population into some groups, and then you want to simulate what happens to that population over time in order to have a more realistic depiction in your simulation of what's going on in your system that you're trying to study. And so if you wanted to try to figure out what population parameters you need in order to have a good simulation, you need to perform sampling. And before you perform sampling, you have to design your experiment. And part of that design, what you'll get practice with on homework one, is really, really think long and hard about the characteristics of your population. Now, of course, if you were doing this for real, you'd go to the state and you'd pull uh, all sorts of data sources that the state maintains about all sorts of things. And it looks at from uh, housing records, right? When people buy homes, uh, where did they come from? right? Where do they live? It looks at school records. Uh, what's their placement from various high schools uh, to colleges or vocational programs uh, for all the high schools? So you try to construct a picture, if you will, of what's going on in the real system, and that's going to require you to do the right visualization. It's going to require you to go to the right organizations, health and human services, uh, the Department of Education, the Department of Transportation, um, the, the buildings and records uh, for all the different counties, right? Uh, all that information just to try to get an understanding of what is a good representation of your population. Now, if you're doing something about this at a state level, it'd probably take you about you know, a couple months, maybe six months, uh, with a group, not just you uh, to try to cull together all this information in order to just end up with the design of the population. Now, certainly in an example, I can talk about homeless population and have those four categories of homeless and say we're going to sample. But in reality, um, the analysis of the data and the deciding upon what data you have is going to take some time. Uh, so when you do this assignment, homework one, uh, don't be surprised if you spend about 60% of your time just thinking about stuff and looking up information, because that's what is typical uh, of what happens in a real situation. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Make sense? Oh, let me hydrate here. <clears throat> okay, excuse me. <clears throat> so let's continue on.
So what are these tests? I just alluded to that in reality, you don't get to see the red line that describes the ground truth um, population parameter. What you see is that blue line that is very jagged. And so one of the issues is, yes, you can increase the sample size uh, in order to get a more realistic representation uh, of the ground truth parameter with your estimator um, x, x bar, the sample mean, but you don't know when to stop, right? And the reason you don't know when to stop uh, is because you don't know how close you are. And so you resort to these tests, uh, these quality measures, if you will, uh, that uh, if they answer yes, this thing is high quality, uh, then uh, at the right sample size or at the sample size you have, it's a good, uh, a good replacement. It's a good estimator. Okay. And so one of these tests is called biasness. Uh, an estimator uh, and theta hat, and this is the general notation we'll use, whenever you see hat, it means it's an estimator. Estimator for what? It's an estimator for theta, where theta is the general description in the book and also in certain parts of the literature and statistics. It's a representation of a general parameter. So we have parameter theta, which is the population parameter, like mu is the mean of the ground truth uh, population for their age. Um, when we say theta hat, we say uh, this thing is an estimator uh, for parameter theta. So an estimator theta hat for parameter theta uh, is unbiased if its expected value is exactly the parameter of interest, right? So what does that mean? It says if you take the expectation of theta hat, you get back theta. Now this is a theoretical proof, but we can actually show this working uh, for real in MATLAB. Right? And so how we'd show this working is if we take each one of these uh, X bars, our estimator for mu, and we took the average of these or the mean of these X bars for all of those trials, we should get something that's spot on or very, 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 very close uh, to the ground truth population parameter. And we'll actually end with that and show that. Let me get a time check. It is 10.35, so I have 10 minutes. Let's call it nine minutes. All right. Uh, so expectation of theta hat is equal to theta. And so our estimator, we're going to look at x bar, the sample mean. So we say, that, what is the expectation of x bar, our sample mean? Well, we substitute for what x bar is. It's the sum of all the x's, all the sample measurements divided by n. And so we have this x1 plus x2 plus x3 up to and including dot, dot, dot plus xn. And then we multiply that sum by 1 over n. That's what it means to divide. And so linearity of expectation, we talked last semester about properties of expectation. Whenever you multiply uh, some quantity uh, by a scalar, and 1 over n is a scalar, right? n is some value like 10 or 500 or what have you, it's the same as multiplying that scalar by the expectation of the variable. And so 1 over n times that sum is going to be the same as 1 over n times the expectation of the numerator, right? And so from that, we get the uh, 1 over n times the expectation of the sum x1 plus x2 plus x3 up to and including uh, plus uh, xn. So then we also rely on that property we studied last semester about linearity of expectation. The expectation of a sum is the same as the sum of the expectations. So if we have E of in parentheses, x1 plus x2 plus x3 and so forth, that's the same as the expectation of x1 plus the expectation of x2 plus the expectation of x3 and so forth. So we take each one of these expectations. The expectation of a random variable is called mu, and we substitute mu for each of these e of xi's. So we substitute e of x1 with a mu, we substitute e of x2 with a mu, and we substitute e of xn with a mu. And so that results in us summing together mu uh, little n many times, right? So if you say mu plus mu plus mu plus mu plus mu n many times, that's the same as n times mu, and we end up with n times mu uh, over n. So we have a copy of n in the numerator, a copy of n in the denominator, uh, the n's cancel, and we're left with mu. So yes, absolutely, uh, this estimator x bar um, is a very good replacement uh, for mu, the population mean, because it satisfies this idea of unbiasedness. So anytime you want to determine, is my statistic a good replacement? You take its expectation and see um, how close it is, or if it is exactly this unknown population parameter. Does that make sense? Any questions about this? All right, so let's take the time to actually see in MATLAB. I wasn't originally going to do this, uh, but let's just uh, do it anyways, and just to kind of 
drive home the point and round out uh, our conversation. All right, and we'll do the other stuff on, on Tuesday. I think it's important uh, to see this in, real, uh, in a real experiment or simulation. All right, so let's bring back up this example we had, right? Uh, and I'll also, you know, make sure uh, this gets posted. Uh, let me make sure it runs. Do I have to add path again? Nope. Okay, good. So we had our our sample size, and I'm gonna bump the sample size down to 10, right? And number of trials is 100. And so now I have sample means that I plot. So the last thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to take the mean of the sample means, right? So each time I compute a sample mean, I do that some number of times, 100 times, depending on the trial uh, setting. Uh, and I'm going to say the mean of the sample means, right? That's the expected value of X bar. The expected value is the mean of these statistics. The mean of the sample means I say mean, let me, uh, this, this variable is way too long. <laughs> um, let's call it mean of X bar, right? To make it a little bit shorter. I hate long variable names. All right, so it's going to be the mean of the sample means. Okay, so this is going to show us whether or not X bar is unbiased. So now I'm going to write out a message. Um, uh, I'm going to say um, b -b -b message equals s printf um, e of x bar uh, is equal to percent f backslash n floating point mean of x bar. Okay, so I'm going to display that message, display this message. And so the expectation of X bar in this particular case, and it's going to write out that number. Okay. So let me save that and um, uh, let me run it. So the mean of the sample means in this case is 56 and change. Um, X bar is 55.11. That's pretty close, right? Um, let's uh, make the uh, the sample size a little bit bigger. The sample size was uh, 10. So let's th make that sample size, let's make that fivefold, let's say 50, right? So, and then we'll do this experiment all over again. So when we do that, the mean of the sample means E of X bar is 55.63 and change. So let's make this sample size 500. Uh, let's make it 1,000. Make it significantly bigger. Save, and let's run that again. Now it's 54 and change. So you notice here uh, the expectation of the sample mean x bar is getting closer and closer and closer, but it's still pretty good, you know, all things else being equal. But if we increase this high enough, I think the sample size we had before was 10,000, right? Uh, let's see what happens here, right? we get 55, it diverges, right? Um, that doesn't happen very much. Uh, population is probably not big enough, but nonetheless, as you increase the sample size, right, um, the amount by which X bar varies gets smaller, but if you look gross level at the expectation of the sample mean, it gets much closer. And the reason why it's not super close is because the number of trials isn't high enough. Right? Uh, to be a good expectation, you need to have more values. So let's increase the number of trials tenfold uh, and let's see what happens because that's more of a representation. And when you take uh, of, of, of its behavior, and when you take an expectation, an expectation, remember, it's a probabilistic sum across all the behaviors, all the different values it can take on. Uh, so if you want a good representation of expectation, you need to have a larger number of trials in this example. And so now it goes to 54. And if you tinker with the numbers enough, you'll see it gets to be eventually spot on within uh, the representational error and the computation ability that's possible in MATLAB because MATLAB has limitations on array sizes and so forth. And so the question then, if you're going to estimate some qu uh, quantity, um, you don't know and you don't have access to what the ground truth population parameter is, but you can at least uh, 
issue a statistical test, if you will, as to what the quality, if a particular estimator is a good one or it's a bad one. Now, we're talking about X bar, but one of the things we could talk about is local slope, DDX. We could talk about all sorts of measurements, and this test is the same, this biasness test. Now, this isn't the only test there is. There's another one, a companion. It's um, called consistent, and we'll talk about that on Tuesday. Uh, but the big takeaway here is that, yes, the theory is there, uh, but you also have to take into consideration uh, the engineering concerns, and that has to do with computation, storage, memory, stuff like that. Okay? All right. Any questions about this? Does that make sense? Uh, let me do a time check. So with that, it is 10.43, two minutes early. We'll end there, and I will see you all on Tuesday. Uh, please uh, make sure you take a look at the homework assignment, because it will require majority, 60% or so of your time thinking about the problem. Okay, I'll see you all on Tuesday.